With more than 150 volunteers, Rochester Pollinators is committed to providing education and resources to help preserve the monarch butterfly and pollinator population. To tell us more about the initiative and help us better understand which plants are native to Michigan is the founder of Rochester Pollinators, Marilyn Trent. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. We're I love so to, happy to have you. Well, I love to talk about my favorite subject, hey, pollinators and the plants that um, feed them. Yeah, how did you come to be here? How, how did this end up a huge part of your life? Well, um, in 2019, I got a letter, a brochure, oh. Marketing Works, and it said, help save <laughs> the monarch butterfly before it was too late. So I said, oh my gosh, what can I do? And I found out that all you have to do is plant milkweed because that is the plant that the but monarch butterfly lays its eggs and it's a plant that will help save the monarch and that's what we don't have enough of. And so I thought, okay, I need to tell everybody because this is something I can do. Because I, I worry about the environment, I worry about our wildlife and I know I, and I wanna feed, I wanna feed the polar bear that fish, but I can't. But this is something I can do in my own yard. And so once I learned that the monarch butterfly was in decline, I've learned so much more. It's more than uh, the milkweed plant. And we're in a great spot, as, especially to be able to help out. I mean, for example, just uh, obviously our neighbors, well, here over mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. east, then you've mm -hmm. got Point Pelee in ah. southern Canada that is that they have the massive amount of monarchs that go through when they're migratory. So, I mean, this is a great area to be able to contribute as well. Yes, it is. Uh, this area uh, produces the super butterfly. <laughs> it is the fourth generation of the migratory path of the monarch butterfly. So if you're not familiar with that, it is, uh, it was, it's a fourth generation that flies from central Mexico to, um, in the, uh, to uh, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And the fourth generation will be here in, uh, next month. So we need to be ready. Oh, gotcha. And so it will go into another generation and then it flies south in um, October and it flies 2,800 miles. Wow. It's an amazing migratory path just that you brought yeah. up. Oh, there you go. There we go. Wow. Here it, it is. is. <laughs> it is right wow. here. And so it will fly the 2,800 miles to central Mexico. And um, it will overwinter for six months and it will start its migratory path uh, back. Um, and it will uh, lay it eggs, lays it eggs, the female will, and probably already has. And then when those eggs are hatched, the next, uh, Butterfly will fly to the corn belt, and then it does their it does the um, cycle again, and then it comes to Michigan. And I didn't know this; oh. I had no idea. A lot of people took classes. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, maybe I wasn't paying attention. But. I mean, talk about a butterfly effect. Nature yeah. is amazing. That's that is wild. so incredible. And you said obviously that we have to be ready for it then. So uh, getting some milkweed and different plants in the ground. So what are the three different plants that we've got right here? Well, right here, I mean, after the milkweed is the host plant for the monarch. So it lays its eggs on this plant. And this is the only plant, the cat caterpillar that and that's what the monarch knows, mm -hmm. that the caterpillar will live, eat those leaves, and that's where you get the hungry caterpillar because it will um, grow 2,000% in 10 to 14 days. Wow. And then it creates a beautiful chrysalis, then in it, and then in 10 to 14 days it emerges. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful life cycle, but it also needs more nectar to, and, uh, to live on. Mm -hmm. So it has... We have a coneflower here, we have a north blazing star, but that's where we talk about having the biodiversity of Michigan native plants. And it's only the native plants that these insects can live on, and that's what we're here to talk about. Now, is it's, it just a matter of not enough milkweed? What else has contributed to yeah. that population declining so much? Well, um, over 40 million acres has been um, turned into lawn. Uh. So, Okay. Turf those grass. Lawns. Yeah, yeah, those lawns. Yep. <laughs> yes. Seems to be a, a, a <laughs> constant subject with it then. <laughs> yeah, it's our biggest agricultural product. And if you think about it, it produces nothing. So yeah. that's the downside. We do like to play on our lawns some, you know, but you, you don't need all of that. But the next thing is pesticides and herbicides, which is used on the lawns mm -hmm. to, you know, keep them green because they are a non-native. So they don't, they're not from here. These guys um, can, uh, they don't need as much water. They don't need herbicides and pesticides. 
they just pop up every year, they expand, they don't need very much. Basically neglect them, and, but not our grass. And people that might be sitting at home going, oh, but you know, they might just be green plants or anything like that. We were talking before, you said, I mean, they flower, they get very pretty. Oh, they do, gardens. they do. Um, yes, they have, uh, this one has got a beautiful purple flower. Um, and it, uh, a little puffs of purple flowers. It's a north blazing star. The cone flower has a gorgeous, like, uh, pink um, uh, petals with a orange uh, iridescent center. Mm -hmm. And in the and in the fall, the goldfinch will eat its seeds. So it's oh. really quite cool. It's so very it attracts pretty. some goldfinches yeah, then cool. too. Yeah, because nice. you nice. leave your seed heads. It's yeah. a whole life cycle. Nature knew what she was doing. So it's a it's a life cycle. So the seed heads would stay on and feed the birds. And then um, the uh, stems, the stalks, is uh, when you see bee houses mm -hmm. and you see those little tubes. That is reproducing the stalks that the solitary bees lay their eggs in and that's where their larvae live. Okay. So you're leaving the stalks knee high, you leave the leaves because, well, I know it's, it's hard to believe, but <laughs> nature had another idea for that. Yeah. Um, the larvae and the eggs and the butterflies that don't migrate are overwintering in their warm little blanket in those leaves. And if you take it to the curb, that's another reason for the decline yeah. because you're breaking that, that cycle of the leaves falling off the trees and then the um, insects living there and the nutrients of the leaves going back into the soil. So we've disrupted the ecological system. And I know we all like to have beautiful lawns, but you can keep it tidy. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I tell people is don't be afraid of these plants. They're not going to break in your house or steal your wine or anything. <laughs> what they'll do is... We would have a problem then. <laughs> They're not going to do that. What they're going to do is if you get the home garden friendly ones, they, um, they, uh, they're they very beautiful and you don't realize that they're native plants. Because some people are like, oh, wildflowers. Yeah. And you know, some of them have bad names or it's names like mm -hmm. sneezeweed that it's really hard to sell. <laughs> so, <laughs> Especially now in the spring. And, yeah, <laughs> but, it, but it was, the name was because it helped colds. It was a cold, ah. it, you know, it was a medicinal uh, for colds used for okay. medicinal person purposes. So then if you have sneezeweed and swamp milkweed is actually what the other name is. So we call this rose milkweed. I mean, I'm not making these names. <laughs> it's okay. There's some unfortunate names in weather that start to get blown yeah. up over the past few years. So you mentioned these are pretty low maintenance. Before we take a quick break, yep. for someone who doesn't exactly have a green thumb, they want to help this butterfly population. They go and pick up a plant that size. Is just planting one of those going to be no, good enough? Need, no, it isn't. Biodiversity, and you need usually three of each. And um, we have garden plans um, that I had. Uh, I guess I don't have it here, but they're on our website, and, in, and it shows the heights and, the, and um, the colors, and it has when they bloom. So you like to get the ones that start blooming in May, and you intersperse the ones that maybe bloom in June and July. So this one will bloom in uh, June and um, July, but this one is blooming in the fall, so, okay. or by August, I'm sorry, August, September. And the cone flower starts blooming in July as well. So yeah, and I'm a lazy gardener. I was the worst gardener ever. I mean, I'm like, now, you know, so now I'm like, are you garden, you know, don't come look at my garden. It, it does the job for us. <laughs> perfect. It's perfect. It does, yeah, and we, we integrate them. Integrate them, we don't say, um, you know, a wholesale replacement. Right. You know, get used to them, like them a little, you'll like them more. Yeah. They're really nice, they're friendly. <laughs> They come back every year. Beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for bringing them by. So after the break, Brian from Bees in the D will be back because mm -hmm. we can't talk about all these flowers without talking about. So don't go bees. anywhere yet. Okay. <laughs> all right. so stay with us. We'll oh, be gosh. right back. All right.